I'm pissed for taking care of my son, Kirk. Lord, we welcome in him and pray that he's an asset and a blessing to the life of Jesus Christ. John chapter 11. I want to take an incident out of this chapter, familiar to most, if not all, present tonight. Following the death and resurrection of Lazarus, I want to have some dialogue around the conversation between Jesus and Martha. So in John 11, beginning at verse number 17, is where we'll start tonight. Would you do me a favor? You look at somebody on your left, on your right, and say, neighbor. neighbor. A lot of things you've done today. I can't do anything about them. But neighbor, one thing you're not going to do. You're not going to beat me. Saying amen to the preacher. That's what I'm trying. In verse number 17, here's what the word of the Lord reads from the New King James. So when Jesus came, he found out he'd already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him but Mary was sitting in the house and Martha said to Jesus Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died but even now I know that whatever you ask of God God will give you Jesus said to her your brother will rise again Martha said to him I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus' question at the end of verse 26 is, do you believe this? Tonight, I want to preach from this thematic thrust with the Lord's help and your uh, amens prayerfully. I want to talk about breakthrough belief. Can you see it? If you stand Tonight, I'd like to begin this Discussion around this conversation with a bit of unfortunate news. And that is this, God reserves the sovereign right to disappoint us. I grew up singing a song in church that says, Jesus will never say no. <laughs> Fortunately, scripture and experience come to contradict the words of that church song. Sometimes, verbally, or just in his providential absence, lack of attentiveness to the specifics of our prayer, Jesus does sometimes say no. Tonight, you are surrounded by a bunch of spiritual people that always pray the right prayers every time they pray. So if you and I can just dialogue one-on-one, -on -one, let me suggest to you, my brother, my sister, that there are times when you think you know what to pray. Only to discover that Jesus has something different in mind than the outcome of your prayer. So, because he is in charge of the affairs of heaven and earth, since the end of his goal is his own glory, he reserves the right to disappoint us 
Because whenever Jesus says no to something we have prayed for, it's always because he has something better in mind. That's what happens in John chapter 11. When Mary and Martha are praying a prayer for healing, Jesus gets news in John 11 that uh, their, their, their brother, his friend, Lazarus, is sick. Lazarus is sick and they know Jesus is completely capable of working healing. They have seen him do it time and time again. So they pray a prayer that they know he can answer. Jesus, Lazarus, whom you love, is sick and the Bible says that Jesus with absence says no to the prayer for healing it's because when they are praying a healing prayer he has a resurrection plan I don't know if you're not who I'm speaking to but perhaps I'm speaking to somebody tonight that's been struggling with sovereign disappointment because or dis disappointment with the things of God because it seems like God is not moving as fast as you want him to move in the way you want him to be move. You have been clear. You have been you have been uh, prayerful. You have in fact uh, been consistent in your prayer, asking God to save, to deliver, to help, to to buoy up your sinking situation, only to discover that God has decided not to give you a yes to what you prayed for because He's got something better. In mind. Now, I got another piece of bad news that I want to transition with here tonight, and it's this. Not only does he have the sovereign right to say no and disappoint us, but sometimes the pathway to God's best is through a worsening circumstance. That's the situation that Mary and Martha find themselves in because when they first ask Jesus to intervene in their life, Lazarus is but sick. But when Jesus finally shows up on the scene, Lazarus is now dead. I, I wonder tonight if you're in here where you prayed about something and things seemingly have had a decline since you prayed. I, have you ever been there when you ask God to pay bills only to discover that bills have stacked up higher since you started praying? You've asked God to save a child and the child is seemingly getting worse since you started praying. You've asked God to fix your employment situation and you just had a bad job. Now you're at no job and things have gotten worse. I've got to tell somebody tonight that sometimes he disappoints us and sometimes he allows our situations to decline and it's for this simple truth, brothers and sisters, and here is all I'm trying to say tonight. I'm simply trying to suggest that God sometimes disappoints us and sometimes allows things to decline because he's trying to give us an opportunity to exercise and experience breakthrough belief. What is that? It's simply this. It's a belief that trusts God no matter how bad, how dark, or how disappointing the circumstance is. That's all I'm trying to suggest. I'm trying to suggest that though things are getting worse, you got to still believe God. Though, though life is throwing curveballs and you keep swinging, listen, you got to still believe God. Though you don't see the end of the light at the end of the tunnel, you got to still believe God. you got to trust that God has something good for you in the midst of every bad circumstance and if you can hold on to faith by letting go of your disappointment, God can do more for you at the end of your struggle than you anticipated at the beginning of your struggle. I'm talking to somebody here who's praying healing prayers and God's got a resurrection plan. Here is what Paul said. He's able to do exceeding abundantly In John 11 is, is a series of conversations that happen before manifestation. Because before Jesus lifts Lazarus and raises him from the dead, he's got to give Martha and Mary an opportunity to experience this breakthrough belief. And this initial conversation with Martha is a picture of this and, and it teaches us about the tensions that we got to deal with. The 
I'm with dealing with divine disappointment. I, I don't have a cute outline, Pastor. I'm sorry. I, I just got three raggedy little points that I want to just leave with you tonight. And then I'll, I'll get in my seat. I, I want you to notice, first of all, that to get through, to break through belief, uh, you and I must wrestle with the tension of divine timing. We got to wrestle with the tension of divine timing. We got to wrestle with the tension of the reality that God is not concerned about our clocks or our calendars. So here it is. John 11 says, they tell Jesus that Lazarus is sick. He stays where he is two more days. By the time he shows up on the scene where Lazarus is now dead, Lazarus has been dead for four long days. Here's the text now. Jesus comes in verse 17. He found out Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany's near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and the Bible says there are, there are a crowd of Jews from Jerusalem who have come out to Bethany to comfort Martha and Mary, Mary and Martha. And the Bible says when Martha heard that Jesus was on the way, watch this, uh, she runs out to meet him while Mary is still sitting in the house and watch her statement in verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, can, can, I, can I extend it? it, it it's, if you had been here, on time, my brother would, would not have would not have died. I, I'm, I'm suggesting I'm suggesting that you gotta wrestle with the tension of the reality that Jesus is not concerned about our clocks or our calendars. Here, here shows up four days after he's dead. This is intentional because he is trying to use, this is the seventh major miracle of the Gospel of John. John writes in seven major miracles, seven major signs to prove the reality that Jesus is the Christ and really God in flesh. He tells us his thesis at the end of his book, these things have been written that you 